Good morning, church. Hey, I have a whole list of complaints. No, I'm just kidding. It's a list of prayer requests and other announcements. Um, God is good, amen? Uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are glad you are here. Um, you are honored guests. Um, we're glad everyone is here. Uh, just so you know, so there's no confusion, um, we are having Christmas or church on Christmas. I know a lot of churches are canceling, but I figure if the whole reason the church exists is because of this holiday, we should probably be here. So we'll be here. Um, you know, so hopefully we'll see you here. Um, let's see, we continue to pray for Brian Betchel, uh, for Pauletta Taylor, Virgil and Sue Angus, Bill Keith, Bob Flowers, Carl and Brenda Lakes, um, and also Lori Barnett gave me word today her great aunt Charlene Prophet is in the hospital. Um, she used to come here before she went into a nursing home. She's doing very poorly, so keep Charlene Prophet in your prayer. Uh, Dave Taylor also asked that we pray for... Um, his friends Arnold and Joan, their daughter Pam is waiting for a liver transplant. Um, and then his other friends, the McIntosh family, lost their daughter and son within 10 days of each other. So um, always remember, while Christmas is a great time, it's not always the most wonderful time of the year for everyone. So keep those people in your prayers. Um, also, Joyce Scally's sister has been diagnosed with vascular dementia. Uh, Liz Kemplin is going through some tests and praying for good test results. Um, and so those are the things we need to keep in prayer. Um, for announcements, um, Shalom is back on the table, so praise God for that. Um, so we will be starting, our week will be February um, 12th through the 19th. Um, there's a sign-up sheet. We're really, like Rob said, going to need some overnight people, but we're going to need all kinds of people to help. Um, this is nothing new to us. We just haven't done it for a few years because of COVID. So um, please do that. In the meantime, the city is, or the church is in Shalom, not the city, because they're done with this whole thing. Um, thank Jesus. Um, they're organizing what's called a white flag shelter down at First United Methodist Church to get us through till January 1st. And what that means is anytime the temperature goes below 30 at night, they will open that building up at the First United Methodist Church downtown uh, across from the library uh, for people to stay the night. They're in need of volunteers from each congregation. So if you feel like you can stay the night there or serve in any capacity, please let me know um, and really could use your help to step up to do that. Um, also, next week, um, the uh, communion will be during my sermon, so I don't throw anyone off. I'll be doing communion during the sermon, so it won't be before like you're used to. And also, the kids, I believe, will be singing some, some cool Christmas songs next week during service as well, so that's something to look forward to. Um, also, Rob and I are starting a new Wednesday night class this Wednesday. It's a video-driven one called... Um, one at a Time by Kyle Eidelman. If you're familiar with, we've done a lot of his studies like Not a Fan, Gods at War, Aha. Uh, I think you're going to want to be part of this. It's video driven and discussion driven. So uh, it's really great stuff. And I think you're going to want to be here for that. Um, so other than that, I think that's what I have. I've read all 364.2 things. Um, so let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you. You are our source, the rock of our salvation, the only God. And we bow down to you in the midst of a world that's telling us to bow down to everything else, Father. We give our allegiance to you and to you alone. And Father, we are talking today about the birth of your Son and why that matters and how important it is. God, this preparation for this sermon touched me very deeply, and I pray, and it has been my prayer all week, that it would do the same for the congregation. And before we get started with your word, Father, we bring some people before you. We bring Brian... Betcho before you. We bring Pauletta Taylor, Virgil and Sue Angla Angus, Bill Keith, Bob Flowers, Carl and Brenda Lakes, Charlene Prophet, um, Pam, um, the McIntosh family at this time of loss, Joyce Scally's sister with dementia, Liz Kemplin and her test results. Um, Father, we praise you that you not only hear our prayers, but you answer them. And we know that you are a God who sees us. And so we praise you and thank you. Lord, hear our prayer. Heal these people according to your will and be with them according to their need. Father, thank you for this wonderful church family at Cross Point. Thank you uh, for your son Jesus who died and rose again. And, and Father, um, may the words I say this morning be from you and not from me. In Jesus' name I pray. Church said, amen. Um, let's see if I did. Also, yesterday, I just wanted to give a shout out to my lovely wife and all the people that helped her. Cookies with Santa was great yesterday, so praise God. Um, if you didn't help out with that, uh, next year make sure to do it because it's a great thing. Um, so it was a great time. Lots of kids. There was 
all, all have had a great time. She got snow thrown all over her, and it was great. It's also the time of the year where the church empties our shredders, um, and then we throw it at kids. So it's a good day. Amen? No, but Christy, you did a great job, and I'm so proud of you. Um, so the past couple of weeks, we have looked at, um, we're looking through these older Christmas hymns on our playlist of Christmas songs, but I want to jump forward to the pretty modern one in which we just sang, Mary, Did You Know? Um, this particular hymn was written by a guy named Mark Lowry and Buddy Green around 1984 as part of a church's local Christmas program, and it doesn't have any really cool stories behind it other than the effect it has on people now much later than it did when it was originally written. Um, what's what shines in this song are the actual words of it. Um, and as you just heard, this carol is all about someone asking if Mary, or asking Mary all these questions about the baby she gave birth to, right? Like, did she know what Jesus was going to be like? And all of this comes about in a rather miraculous sense, as we saw with Luke's account. So I want to reread that, what Dylan read, just to get our minds wrapped around it. So in Luke chapter 1, verse 26, it says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, another miraculous birth, by the way, uh, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, to a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. That's important. Um, the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly in trouble at his words, you think? Um, and wonder what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from the Lord will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be to me fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Like, the magnitude of this announcement is, is kind of a breathtaking thing, right? I mean, especially if you're Mary, right? Imagine being Mary. Like, how hard is this to process? I mean, one minute you're out doing your daily chores, and the next God's chief messenger angel, Gabriel, appears to you and speaks this wild announcement to you. And, and I mean, this is a lot for a Middle Eastern teenage girl living in the armpit of the Roman Empire to process. And she even asks, how's this going to happen? You know, I, I can't have a kid. I don't even have a husband yet. And I wonder if Mary thought the angel did not understand biology and human reproduction. But I kind of feel like this isn't the place to have the talk with an angel. And I think Mary thought that as well, right? She's just like, whoa. So, um, but the thing about Mary is I love her faith, right? Even in her doubts and all these questions, I love what she says. She says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. What an incredible trust and obedience that Mary has. Like, who wants to volunteer to somehow smuggle God himself into the world, not even knowing what that entails, what it means? Technically, she was voluntold, but she accepted it, right? She didn't understand the details. She didn't need to. She didn't know what Joseph would say when she was pregnant, which is scandalous, because now you have this unwed mother in a very religious community that doesn't take kindly to unwed mothers, um, all of a sudden going to be the one to bring the Son of God into the world? And Joseph's supposed to be like, hey honey, I got pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And he's probably like, is that like a gang in town or something, honey? What? Like, you know, it's, it's like, it also amazes me that the church is so quick to jump on people who have kids out of wedlock. Because that's exactly how our Savior came into the world. That doesn't mean it's the greatest option or the best idea, but it's funny to me how we just like disown people or call them the most terrible things because they have kids before they're married. That's how Jesus came into the earth. Mary didn't know a whole lot of the social stigmas that she'd have to endure. But she says, I'm yours, Lord. Do to me as you say. Imagine if you and me would only do the same thing. 
God's not asking you to smuggle Jesus into the world. Sometimes God's just asking you to help someone across the street. Imagine if we just did, with trust and obedience, the same thing Mary did. So let us hit fast forward. The time comes for Jesus to be born. Mary has had nine months to process all this, and six of those months were spent very far away from her hometown and her fiancé at her relative Elizabeth's house. But now Joseph is ordered, like every other citizen in the empire, to go to his ancestral home, and his happens to be Bethlehem, the city of David. Uh, to register for this census. It's about 100 miles by donkey for an extremely pregnant woman, and they get within a few miles of the city limits of Bethlehem, of this little town, and Mary's water breaks. She starts having contractions, and they get to the city, and it is packed. There are no rooms available. Everyone says no vacancy, but there's a particular innkeeper that they come across who we often get a bad rap give a bad rap we say it's the innkeeper that turned away jesus no he literally didn't have a place to put him but he made a place so he he has as much mercy as he humanly can seeing a woman in active labor riding a donkey um and so he decides hey i got a cave underneath here where we store the the animals it's got a manger you can lay the baby in um and so that's not the ideal place to give birth but it's the best i got so joseph says well take it right mary goes down and Another weird thing is that night a group of shepherds comes to visit, per the angel's amazing light show, their songs and instructions, and they told Mary what the angel told them after Jesus is born. It says this, but the angel told them, do not be afraid. They always have to say that. Angels have to be terrifying to look at, right? Um, but I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. That's you and me too. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And then there's this line, the one that I want us to focus on and pair it with the song. It says this, when they are telling Mary this, what they've seen, what they've experienced in Luke 2.19, it says, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. I would love to know what Mary is thinking, wouldn't you? Like, I mean... You've had nine months to process this, but I don't, I don't know if you ever really fully processed the magnitude of such a thing. But like, it's different thinking about a, an event than it is to actually live an event, right? Like, here we have this baby boy. He's now born. And people are coming from out the outskirts of town, out in the fields in the middle of the night to tell you stuff angels told them. You were visited with an angel, and you were just there looking down into the face of this little newborn, and you're just in awe. Like, you have heard about the magnitude that this one birth is going to have, but what exactly does that mean? So we ask the question, Mary, did you know? And the opening stanza of this Christmas carol is, is rather prolific. The whole song is, and I could dissect this hymn for, for weeks at a time, but I don't have that time. But here's the first few words of the song. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know the baby boy has come to make, us, to make you new and the child that you delivered will soon deliver you? The moment your children are born are moments that you never forget, right? I remember holding Harper, this tiny, five-week early little girl and man from second one i was wrapped and then the struggle of her to stay alive for the next five weeks in dayton children's hospital and living at the ronald mcdonald house and all of you people praying for her and all of this stuff and i will never forget holding her in my arms i can't hardly even pick her up now but i used to be able to hold her right in here looking into her little eyes and never knowing that your heart could expand to have so much love. And I remember holding Emmett the very first time and having the same feelings all over again and never knowing my heart could expand even more to fill with love for this little boy. And man, is he rotten. All the good stuff he has comes from his mom. All the rottenness is from me. I'm sure you knew that, but... Hey, that wasn't an amen, Tommy. But here's the thing, I'm not the one. I'm not the one who gave birth. 
So I know I only have a fractional degree of perception on what all this means and feels like. Okay? Like, guys have it easy in the whole having a baby thing. Yes, that's an amen. Guys, you have it easy. We can't even get a fever without feeling like it's over. But women somehow work through it. Women can give birth, right? I'm not the one who carried this baby inside of me for almost a year. I'm not the one with morning sickness or is eating weird things like Oreos and orange juice. I'm not the one who's like eating peanut butter and pickle bacon sandwiches or whatever craving you might have. Christy didn't have that one, but she did like bacon for nine months and she hates it again. She always hates bacon. When she was pregnant with Emmett, best nine months of eating of our marriage Um, because we could have bacon. Um, but I'm not the one who carried this child inside. I'm not the one who like had to give, in Christie's case, give myself shots multiple times a day just to stay pregnant. I wasn't the one who went through the greatest pain known to humankind that leads a woman almost to the edge of death to give birth to my kids. I'm not the one who screamed in agony, who pushed, who gave every bit of my life energy to bring my kids into this world. No, that was my wife. And man, I am still both in awe of her strength and proud of her. All women are rock stars, man. We sneeze and it's, we're thinking it's the end. We're like, honey, I write up the will. Men are like, you know what? I'm sick. The remote's like three inches away. Could you get it for me? I know this. I had strep throat like last week, so I get it. Honey, I can't roll over. I'm just so sick. So as a guy, I cannot know what it means for Christy to hold our babies for the first time and that deep, special bond that a mother has and the thoughts she had and the things she pondered and the life she imagined for them. Likewise, we cannot, women have a better idea, but we collectively, men and women, cannot know exactly how Mary felt and how she thought and treasured as she looked down at this little wrinkly red screaming human being while surrounded by animal waste and animal stank in a cave in an obscure town. But I ask with this song, you know, I can't help it. Mary, did you know? Like, did you have any idea about this? Like, did you know? Did you have any clue what was going to happen over the next 33 years? I mean, she did all the normal things. She changed Jesus' diaper. Jesus had those gravity-defying baby poos, I'm sure. Jesus had blowouts. Jesus got sick. Jesus scraped his knee. She gave him Band-Aids. She took care of him. She kissed his boo-boos. She sang him lullabies. Like, Did she have any idea after 30 years how that would transition into something much different? Like, Mary, did you know that you literally just gave birth to God Himself? The Word has become flesh and made His dwelling among us. Did you know that when you kiss that little baby, you are literally kissing the face of God? Did you know your son would be able to stop storms with his hand? Did you know that he would raise dead children and adults back to life during funerals? Did you know that he would unhandicap the handicapped? Did you know that he would be the greatest teacher the world has ever seen? Did you even fathom that 2,000 some years later, he's still the most influential person that has ever or will ever live? Did you know that he would change everything forever? Barry, did you know the pain that you will endure? on what we now call Good Friday, which to her, she would aptly call the worst day of her life. Did you know you would watch your baby boy, when he was grown, be beaten nearly to death and unrecognizable, then forced to carry his cross up a hill, be spat on, mocked, made fun of, tortured, and then watch him be nailed to the cross? I can only imagine that with every crack of the whip, with every slap of the of the rod followed by every blow of the hammer hitting a nail in a little bit of mary died mary did you ever envision you'll be burying your baby boy at the age of 33 in a garden tomb of a rich man that you don't know 
and saying goodbye to your firstborn son in the most tragic way imaginable? I don't think anybody makes those plans when their kids are born, do we? Mary, did you know that three days of the worst grieving and heartache and wondering and pondering what will follow were going to happen to you? And did you know that on the third day your son would come back? And ultimately the question is what this song asks. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know your baby boy has come to make you, Mary, new? And the child you just delivered will deliver you. Your own soul will be saved by the baby boy you just gave birth to. We cannot know whether Mary knew. We could speculate based on our own experience. I mean, she definitely knew this is a special child, right? Like, because there aren't any other birth announcements anymore that are accompanied by angels, right? Like, the best we can come up with are gender reveal parties gone wrong that end up burning down half the state of California. The things about Mary that we do know is that she trusted God and she was obedient to Him. And this little baby lying in a manger that she sang lullabies to. I'm just drawn back to being in the hospital and when we first got there with Harper, I took the night shift and Christy would sleep. And Harper had this uh, ventilator in because she couldn't breathe. And she would cry and her mouth would open and she was screaming at the top of her lungs but no words came out. And I just remember sitting there like, she's in her little incubator, and I would just get up to her and I would sing in her ear. And I would pray. And I would tell her about Jesus. And I would tell her this is going to end someday and it's all going to be okay. But imagine singing a lullaby to the Son of God. She sang a lullaby to the very one who sang creation into existence with a word who spoke the universe into being, who knew everything for all time and was eternal. And also, she was singing a lullaby to the baby that just exited her womb, and the one she's singing to is the God who knit her together in her own mother's womb. And when I ponder what Mary did or didn't know, my mind goes back, strangely, this week to another woman. To the first woman, actually. My mind goes back to Eve, who is the mother of all humankind. And I wonder how she felt after her and Adam were deceived. And they ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And how they must have felt, but particularly how Eve must have felt. To go down unfairly, sort of, in history as the people that ruined everything for everyone else. That's not something you wake up and decide to be. At career day, that's not one of the featured things. Like no one aspires to be part of the cause of being kicked out of paradise and breaking creation, right? But like imagine how you have felt on your worst day. Imagine that. You're probably already there because if you're a human being, you're constantly thinking about that. Imagine that your lowest point and then multiply that by 8 billion. The world just passed 8 billion people. That's a lot of people. I can only imagine Eve would have been shattered. She would have been broken. She would have been destroyed. And chances are you do know how Eve felt because you've been there. Amen? You have sinned against God. You have broken trust. She didn't know it. But when God was cursing Satan in the garden, he already started a rescue plan when he said this. This is amazing. This is the first sign that God is not giving up on his people. Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity, enmity, I can't talk, enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God, had, while he's actually doling out the consequences of breaking the creation, He's also saying, I got something big planned. And serpent, your head's going to get squished. It's the first mention of Jesus we find in the Bible. And I think in that moment of extreme pain and disappointment, she's, Eve is absolutely wrecked. 
like, but, but doesn't even realize what God said. I mean, who would, right? You just did something terrible. You're not really listening. You know what you're doing. Like, when you're in trouble and somebody's yelling at you for being in trouble and you know you're in trouble, you're not listening to the person getting on you because you already know you're in trouble, right? But like Eve, we would all be in shambles. I don't know where it was when I first saw it, but there's this painting. And it was painted by Sister Grace Remington of Our Lady of the Mississippi Abbey. She's a nun. And so pairing this painting with the song Mary Did You Know, it puts two of the most influential people in, in, in our history together. And it, well, it's, it's just about as perfect as you can get. The, the, the painting is called Mary Consoles Eve, and here it is. I'll just let you look at that for a second. Now, we know historically they did not exist at the same time, but the idea is important. The first time I saw this picture, I cried. I still have a hard time looking at it. I mean, look at everything going on here in this picture. Hopeful Mary, consoling broken Eve, looking at her with eyes that say, look up, daughter. God's promised rescue. And I don't know what it looks like either, but the baby in my belly, he's the key to all of this. And he's the one, and I don't know how all this will play out, but take heart because our deliverer has come. God is making all things new. And God is going to save the world just like He promised. And you needn't carry the weight of the world on you anymore. But look at Eve. Look at, look at Eve's body language or posture. She's hunched over. She's crying. She's still clutching her sin. She has the fruit in her hand. She's entangled, look at her feet, by the devil, by the serpent. But Mary will give birth to the one who will crush the serpent once and for all. And if you look under Mary's foot, there's the head of the snake. Mary's going to give birth to the one that will renew the world and make a way for, Adam, for the Adams and Eves of the world, for the yous and me's, to come back home. No matter how imperfect we may be. So I ask again, Mary, did you know? I think she did. I think she did. What I love most about this painting and the song Mary Did You Know is both of them embody this incredible story of God's grace. Right? Like Mary is a co-conspirator in the great redemption story. And maybe I love this picture so much because I know I am Eve in this picture at least. And maybe I love this picture so much because I want to learn to be like Mary too. Right? And the beauty about Christmas, guys, it isn't about presents or cute little nativity scenes or Christmas trees and shopping and family gatherings, and those things are all great, amen? But the meaning of Christmas is that God calls us, us foolish and silly human beings who have wrecked the world into the work of redeeming the world. People broke the world, but God is using people to save it too. Mary even sings in the Scripture, there's this whole thing, it's called the Magnificat. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord in the Scripture. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. And I can tell you in Mary's day, when you're singing this against the Roman Empire, this is an act of treason. So we have to understand Christmas is not about how we were so terribly good and amazing and so holy and fought sin so profoundly and well that God just had to come for us. Read the Bible. Ain't nobody doing that. The greatest heroes of the Bible do some pretty terrible things, amen? You know why? Because they're people. Christmas is not a story of good people winning over a skeptical, distant deity and getting him to come back and pay attention to us. No. He never left. Christmas is a story of a people who would not let go of their sin, but our God came to save us anyway. Mary would, like us, 
come to find the fountain of grace and eternal life in her own son. Do you remember the scene in the temple? They bring Jesus on the eighth day to get him circumcised, as is the custom. And there's this prophetess. She's widowed for like 50 years. She lives in the temple night and day. And she says this line to Mary that blows my mind. She says, this child will pierce your own soul. I don't remember anybody walking up to me after we had kids and they say, you know, that child's going to pierce your own soul. No. Because the child that she just delivered would deliver her. Right? Mary would, like us, come to find the fountain of grace and eternal life in her own son, Jesus. God's own son. Her baby boy. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he would make all things new and he would deliver her just like he has delivered you and me. So if I could say anything to you that I hope you take home, it's rest easy, brothers and sisters, for our Deliverer has come. He has saved us and He is making the world right. The Word became flesh and made its dwelling among us. And we have beheld His glory, the glory of the one and only Son. Pray with me. Father, Christmas is a truly miraculous thing. And I know there is so much stress and so much unhappiness and so much hurt at Christmas as well, and I pray you will minister to that. Father, may we never take for granted the things that we have, our children. May we never get annoyed with them yelling and screaming in church service and being kids because that's what kids do. I'm sure Jesus acted up in synagogue But Lord, the, 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 the faith and obedience of Mary, may we also have that. May we trust You so ruthlessly, no matter what, that whatever You do, whatever You're going to do with our lives, that Father, we submit and we trust and we obey because there is no greater thing than to serve You. And there is no great, greater God other than You. So Father, thank You for the greatest gift of Christmas, Jesus Christ our Lord. And thank You that He was born. That He could die to save us. Help us this Christmas to just take a breath in the midst of all the stress and the worry and the financial strains and the expectations. To take a breath and breathe in the moment just like Mary did in that manger 2,000 years ago. Father, help us as a church to walk in Jesus' footsteps and to know the snake, the serpent, has been crushed under His feet. Father, let us reach out to those in our lives who do not know You. And Father, let us worship You with our whole lives for the rest of our life. In Jesus' name I pray. And the church said, Amen. If you're not a Christian this morning, if you're here, you're visiting, and you want to know how to follow Jesus, the same question is asked at the very first sermon the church ever gives in Acts chapter 2. After Jesus has died and resurrected and ascended back to heaven, Peter gives the whole sermon about it, and they say, what must we do to be saved? And Peter says, repent of your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and you'll receive the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of, your Holy, of the Holy Spirit. And this gift is for everyone. It's not exclusive. So no matter what you've done, where you've been, who you are, what kind of sinner you think you are, how guilty you are, you are not too far from God to be saved. So if you're not a Christian this morning, make that happen. Because Jesus is here. Jesus has come. And He's inviting you to be with Him. Whatever your need is, whether it's prayers or to be baptized, please come forward while together we stand and sing. Amen.